Well, it's good to be with you today. Uh, the fact that you would come on what is either your last Saturday of vacation or the last Saturday that you don't have two tons of work to do uh, makes me very grateful. <clears throat> the other problem, I think, with this kind of topic is we're talking about something that, if I'm not careful, will make you want to do exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about. Uh, maybe because I was a bad kid, I always struggled with daily devotions, reading my Bible and praying every day for the sole reason that Sunday school teachers kept telling me to do it and that it would be good for me. If you announced to me, this will be good for you, it made me want to do exactly the opposite. Now my wife had the opposite problem. If you told her it was good for her, she would do it forever even when it stopped being good for her. So it was good that we got married because the middle ground is good. If you're one of those people like I am, be very careful today that when you hear good advice about study skills, you take it the way it better be intended, and that is proverbially. So before we do anything else, let me describe two kinds of knowledge. See, this is what you get for inviting a philosopher to come and talk to you on a Saturday. It's already, I want study skills, two kinds of knowledge. No, there are two kinds of knowledge, and if you don't keep them separate, I know Christians who run their lives as if proverbs are laws, and laws are proverbs. And if you get those things backwards when it comes to study skills, you'll make mistakes. What are laws? Laws are things that are inevitably true. They're necessarily true. Two plus two equals? Four. Even if you don't think so. Ask my bank. <laughs> I keep trying to mess with math and my bank, but they keep telling me that postmodernism is false and that four minus five really is negative one. It's very sad. There are some things that are always true. Now, I think as a believer, and I'm not going to defend this for you today, I'm just going to say what I think, that moral laws are absolute. If you hate, you are bad. Hating is bad, loving is good. This is kind of absolute. So what should you do? You should always be loving. And in fact, everything you do should be motivated by love. That's an absolute. If you don't do that, you're bad. Then there's proverbial advice. Proverbial advice could be best described as your mileage may vary. Ever see that on TV? They'll say this car gets X to the Y, Z miles to the gallon, but what? Your mileage may vary because, in fact, in driving a car, mileage is a really complicated thing to measure. In an electric car, how many miles you get will depend on the temperature outside. Your mileage may vary simply because you're driving in the country as opposed to the city where you do a lot of stop and go driving. Obviously, an electric car would work best in a place like Southern California where it's flat driving out in the country. Your mileage may vary. Proverbs are like that. Now, there's an entire book of the Bible called? Proverbs. And they're not laws. How do you know? Because Proverbs in the Bible tells you that if you raise goats, you'll prosper. Good luck with that in La Mirada. <laughs> We tried that, it was more of our, no, we didn't actually try raising goats. We tried raising canaries and we didn't prosper. Maybe if we had tried goats, we would have prospered. The, the point is, and everybody knows this, right? The point of the proverb is something like this. Goats in the ancient world were a nice basic way for poor people to become business-like and entrepreneurial. So the message behind the proverb is this. If you do something to start your own business and you don't become indebted or dependent on somebody else, that's a good idea. Does that mean it will always work? No, you can be entrepreneurial, do all the right things, start a business and go bankrupt. Ask Walt Disney, he did. Right, most successful people in fact fail. Proverbs are what you usually should do, except when you shouldn't. And knowing when you shouldn't is part of that virtue called practical wisdom. Most academics don't have it at all. Most academics confuse 
Proverbs with wisdom. Now, what does that have to do with study skills? What you're being presented today are proverbial ideas. So, for example, when I was your age, they told me that I should find one place to study, sit there, and get rid of as much ambient noise as possible so that I could focus. Weirdly, either people have changed or simply the research has gotten better. What do researchers now tell us to do? Move around when you study, have lots of different places, about every 20 minutes, get up and study someplace else. Because it helps you reboot your thinking. And secondly, most of us need the distraction of some kind of background noise. Now, maybe that's because we've changed due to the amount of background noise in our culture, but most people actually study better with some music playing in the background. Now, the minute I say that, I run the risk of having contradicted the person who came right before me. Because research advice like this is a your mileage may vary rule. I happen to be pretty ADD. I'm easily distracted. So in fact, I don't follow that advice at all. I have a hobbit-like hole for an office into which I crawl. If I could make it as small as a stove, I would sit inside it like Descartes allegedly did, blocking off all other patterns and think. It's really weird. I would just crawl up and think because I'm so easily distracted. If I followed the advice that most people should follow, according to research, I'd never get anything done. So if I suggest something to you today, and your mom and dad or you notice that it doesn't work for you, you're not breaking the laws of studying to not do it. You need to do what works for you. So the first thing that I hope you get out of a study skills seminar is that you've learned general truths that work for most people, which means you should try them out, but you should abandon them if they don't work, not try to get good at study skills. I, I know people that are excellent at study skills, but bad at school. They do all the right things, but the things don't work for them. They master the skills, but they don't master what they're supposed to learn in school. So before you do anything else, remember our goal is to read well, write well, think well, and be numerate. Our goal isn't to be good at studying. True? To love my wife well is my goal. To do that, I might go to a seminar and have gone to a seminar about how to be a better husband and friend to my wife, where I'll get general advice that often generally doesn't fit my wife at all. Imagine if I went home and did it anyway and blamed my wife for not liking it. This is what sometimes parents, if we're not careful, will do with our kids and study skills. In fact, our kid learns best in a crowded, happy, eager room, but we heard somewhere that they should work quietly at a desk. Or we heard someone like Reynolds say, hey, ambient noise is okay. Let your kid wear headphones while they study. We have in our house noise-reducing headphones because our house is so loud. Listen to music while you study. But your kid goes crazy. They can't listen to music without just listening to the music. Then forget that. Let it go. So the first thing I want to say is, don't get good at studying. Get good at reading well, writing well, and thinking well. Now I'm going to try to give you some general proverbial advice that will sound like I think all of you should do it all the time. Because that's just the way I sound all the time. I, my poor kids, right? I come in and I'm thinking, well, I wonder what it would be like to live without electricity. And I'll say, we should try living without electricity for a month. And my kids will think, oh, no. <laughs> It's a prophetic word. He's going to make us do it. No, I'm not going to make you do anything. So relax. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> Let's start with reading. Why do we want to know how to read? Like, what's the point? Before you do anything else in studying, I'd like to suggest to you, as a young adult, 
a 14 to 18 year old, which is what I assume I'm talking to, and a parent, that you figure out why you want the skill to start with. Beyond the practical, you happen to live in a culture where literacy is a big deal. You probably can't get a good paying job without being literate. Though in fact, I'm from West Virginia and I knew illiterate people who had really high paying jobs because they had learned how to hide their illiteracy so no one knew it. In fact, it's probably not even true that you have to be literate to get a good job, it just helps. So forget that for a minute. Pretend you live in a culture where you could get an awesome job and be illiterate. Why do all Christian civilizations press literacy? Why do all Christian civilizations end up with huge numbers of people who can read? Somebody tell me. It's a very simple answer, yes. So we can read the Bible. Yeah, I don't want to be all holy, but it's so you can read the Bible for yourself. Whether Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, there's an urban legend that the Pope didn't want people to read the Bible in the Middle Ages. That's just wrong. Literacy spread wherever Christianity went. Now, we didn't always do a perfect job with it. Sometimes we were in cultures so poor that it took us a long time to spread literacy. But after all, the Protestant Reformation wouldn't have been able to take off if lots of people hadn't been able to read Martin Luther's theses that he banged on a door. You know, it can't be both true that the medieval church taught nobody to read and that the printing press caused the Reformation. Ever notice that in some textbooks? Wow, it was a dark and ignorant age, and then the printing press came and changed it all. How? What's, if you couldn't read, you just stand looking at the printing press watching it make noises. That's cool. So that comes down to critical thinking. Why do all Christians want people to read? Because God sent a book, and books have a special status for Jews, Christians, and then our spinoff faith, Islam. We're often called people of the book. But that's even, there's even a deeper reason to know how to read, and it is love. You're called to love, who are you called to love? How many people? Everyone. Everyone, if possible. Now, here's a problem. When Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't want us to suffer. And we became cut off from the source of life. Yet, we had been created to live forever. I want to suggest to you that to be deathless while being cut off from the source of life is worse than dying. If you don't believe me, think of the life of a non-twilight vampire <laughs> or zombie. You go on and on and on and on. And maybe when you're 14, you think, wow, there'd be a lot to do. But I know that in the case of both of my grandmothers who lived long enough to get to this point, into their 90s, not because of their ill health, they were just tired of living. They had done what there is to do within their capacities. They had seen it, done it, thought it, felt it, and all they were going to do if they lived longer was reboot and do it again. Like the classic film Groundhog Day where the person is stuck living a day over and over and over again. There's not enough to do even if you learn to play the piano, become a medical doctor, eventually you tap out your capacity because your capacity for joy right now is limited. If you didn't die, you'd have unending, not death, not unending life. Because humankind found itself cut off from the source of life. Now what does this have to do with reading? You were designed so that you should be able to have a conversation with Adam and Eve and with your great, 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 great grandchildren. We are to live in community. One problem with conventional schools is that most of us become taught to have friends that are within a year or two of our age. As a result, we live with little blind spots. I'm 48 years old, 
most 48-year-olds have friends who are about two or three years on either side of them. That's really defective. But even having a friend who's 80 and a few friends who are in their 20s, look at what a tiny range of knowledge that is. What about the people in the 13th century? How can I love them when they're all dead? The last World War I veteran died in the last year. What that meant was it is now impossible to know someone who knew that world. That world is now no longer immediately accessible to you. God's severe mercy of death, which keeps you going crazy, also traps you in chronological isolation. Reading is God's solution to that problem. You are able to dialogue with the dead without sin. Now, if you go home and say to your parents, if they're not here, Dr. Reynolds taught me to dialogue with the dead. <laughs> I am in big trouble. There are two ways to dialogue with the dead. One of them is naughty. It's called necromancy. You bring the dead back, and as Saul discovered in the Bible, the dead don't always say what you want them to say. Necromancy, you shouldn't do it. This is one of those absolutes. Your mileage doesn't vary with necromancy. What you get is demonized. Reading is a licit way for me to dialogue with Moses, or Jesus, or Paul, or Socrates, or Plato, or for heaven's sakes, Karl Marx and Adolf Hitler. I can read them and dialogue with them. The Bible says, being dead, they yet speak. So why are you learning to read? Because you're lonely in a deep, deep way that you don't even realize. Because you should have great, 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 great grandparents and your great, 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 great grandchildren should be able to talk to you, but you are cut off by death from something that humans naturally need, from sitting down and dialoguing with Eve. Why did you do that? So first of all, step back and realize that when you pick up a book, your chief aim is to dialogue with the author. You are there to love the author. This brings us to the problematic thing of textbooks, which are books written by no actual author. How can you love a textbook? And the answer is you cannot. Or Wikipedia, which has no actual author. It has a conglomeration of authors. Now let's think about why we use a wiki, like Wikipedia. Why do we use one? Somebody tell me really quickly. It's horribly useful. We'll be in a family argument about a film. Immediately I'll pull out my iPhone. Argument settled. Woohoo! It's a golden age. <laughs> what do we use a wiki for? What are they for? Yes, sir. To quickly, to quickly gain free sorted information. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that is the only value of a textbook. A textbook is, in that sense, if it's really a textbook and not a book that's sold as a textbook, a way of getting digestible information quickly. In that sense, you don't actually read a textbook. So let me push that aside. I'll talk to you about that for a second. What is the first thing I said you had to do when you approach a book that's not a textbook? Love the author. So try, before you pick up Plato, to know something about Plato, his life and times. Before you pick up a book written by Moses, try to know something about Moses, his life and times. And while you're reading the book, you're called to love even your enemies. So a lot of Christians approach a book to find what's wrong with it. Let me suggest to you that you can't dialogue with a book, even a wicked book, and some of you aren't in an age where you should read certain books. Your parents can decide that. But by the time you're an adult, when you enter into a dialogue with a book, you should first find what's good, true, and beautiful about it. Why did someone print it? Why has it been effective for centuries, if it has been? 
why do some of your friends, so you pick up, I sometimes read novels because my students are. So you pick up, a, I'll have to pick up a cultural junk novel that's popular like The Da Vinci Code, which was popular about a decade ago. And I had to pick it up and read it. Now, it was obvious that it was attacking my faith, the faith I hold dear and the Lord I love dear, but I first had to love Dan Brown, understand what he was writing, wrestle with it, say, why would he say stuff like this, and then condemn him. In the same way that a parent loves their child first and then condemns their sin. In other words, if you can't do that with an author safely, you shouldn't read that book. If you can't love them without becoming them, that's not a book you can read. You're too weak to read it. Because you're not really reading a book the way books were designed if all you do is hunt for the problems, say, that's a heresy, that's a heresy. If you don't get a book before you condemn it, you shouldn't condemn it. You should keep your mouth shut. You're like the person who goes to a movie to count the number of swear words and naughty things. You can't review a movie. All you did was look for what's wrong with the movie, not with what's right with the movie. Now, there may be a place for people to do that, but that's not watching a film and it's not reading a book. So there may be books you cannot read. Does everyone get that? Almost no one in here should go read Adolf Hitler's My Struggle, Mein Kampf. Because to crawl inside of Hitler's mind and to become charitable to Hitler to understand why someone created in God's image would become this way is not a work that most of you have to do. In fact, it's not a work I have to do, so I've never made it all the way through Mein Kampf. To know that Nazism is evil from the inside out is not something I need to do to do my job, so why would I do it? But in most of the books, you'd be assigned in a place like Tory Academy or in Star, you can safely Think about what Wordsworth said, even if you'll come to disagree with him deeply. You should become sympathetic without becoming pathetic. So that's my first rule, and it's the hardest thing I'll say, the most controversial thing I'll say. The second thing is to realize what books do well, that movies do not do well. Movies, film, which I love and teach, arouse the passions in general better than books. And there's nothing wrong with arousing your passions. If you want to feel the passion of courage, I would suggest watching the film, if it's appropriate to your age, Braveheart. Braveheart will inculcate in you feelings of courage. If you want to think about courage, you cannot watch a film. What books do that films don't do is have the ability to make left to right arguments. One, two, three, therefore four. Even in a novel, they can make arguments, which brings us to critical thinking. Generally, you don't go to a film to think, and it's not particularly appropriate to do so. You go to a film either to be entertained, nothing wrong with that, or to have your emotions educated. Now you can think about that process at the end, but if you're thinking while you do it, you won't get it. It's like walking on a moonlit beach with a woman or guy you love, taking her hand and thinking about being in love. If you're thinking about being in love, you're not being in love. When you read a book, you have an ability to feel and think simultaneously that is unique to any other subject except for playing music yourself. The only other thing I know a comparable to reading is someone who plays the piano very well and learns to play it themselves. So if you want to read well, what did I say first you had to do? Love the author. Love the author. And try to get, don't say Shakespeare bores me say, I'm too boring to understand Shakespeare. Here, here's the thing, Bill is going to keep being famous long after you're dead. And you get to talk to the 17th or 16th century 
And believe it or not, your soul desperately needs to talk to the 16th century. Death has cut you off. The second thing I said you need to do. Find out what books do well and constantly argue with a book. Now, sometimes a book will sweep you away and try to inculcate your passions, but I want to suggest that books that are mostly about passion, what we might call romance novels of the low sort, Harlequin romances when I was a kid, though they've now degenerated into softcore porn. But just passion books are not worth reading. Just go watch a movie. In general, films will educate your passions better than books. So the books that are worth reading are usually books that stir you up. Lord of the Rings would be a good example for me. Make you think a little bit, but don't ever tell you to stop thinking. There are some books I've read, Twilight would be one of them, which I read because my students were, and I enjoyed it on a passionate level. But if I thought about it, the minute I thought about it, the book collapsed. It, it wasn't designed for me to think about it. On the other hand, a romantic novel, Wuthering Heights, written by a pastor's daughter, stirred up my passions but commanded me to think about my passions. That's a book worth reading. So how do you know whether a book is worth reading? It does what a book does well and doesn't do what a book does badly. What does a book do well? Make you think. Otherwise, you're lucky to live in an age where you can go to lots of live theater or watch a movie. If what you need is passion education. The third thing, if you wanna read well, and then we'll get to textbooks, is read a lot. You should almost surely read for two or three hours for every hour you spend in video time. I know no one who reads well who doesn't read a lot. If you read badly by your age, I can prob unless you're learning disabled, which is possible, I can probably monitor how much you've read almost up to this point in your life, and you've gotten to an age where they want you to run for five miles, but you've only ever run for 500 yards. Leaders read, gentlemen and ladies read, I know of no exception to this rule. Why is reading so uniquely helpful? It's the same reason that if you don't play a musical instrument, you should go learn how to play one. Because reading engages all three parts of you, your body, your mind, and your heart simultaneously. Playing the piano or playing the guitar would also do that. It prepares you to be a better lover of your country, of your spouse, of your family, because it teaches you to integrate yourself if you become a good reader. And a good reader is someone who can get lost in the book and tune out everything else that's going around them. That's how you know you've achieved good reading status. If you have a kid that's doing that, don't punish them, just help them not be rude. You should celebrate that moment. If you can get to the point in a book a serious book where you get lost in it, you've achieved the goal of an educated person. You are talking to the dead without sin, if it's a dead author. Or you're talking to someone who's not there without sin. You have defeated your chronological loneliness. That's why so many of you can have a whole day go by, almost excessively, you're feeding a part of your heart that most people never get fed. Old film is like this too, in a smaller way. How can you become a better reader practically, even with textbooks? Treat textbooks as books to be chopped up, used, and abused. By this I mean use them to get the information you need, highlight, find out what it is you're supposed to learn from that textbook, and go get that information the way you would if it were Google. So if they hand you, and this, you're the last generation that will face this, if they hand you a paper and ink textbook and you're the last generation who will get them, think, I'm Googling, drilling for the information I need. And here is the most important thing my students do not have when they come to college. And that is a framework of history in which to hang the facts they get. Parents? 
if your child doesn't know the decade the Second World War occurred in, they will be unable to understand the newspaper. They may know tons of facts about George Washington, but if they don't have a feel for the time distance between Washington and Plato, you're going to end up with a student that no matter how good their college education is, has a jumble of facts without any framework to put them in. Imagine if I handed you tons of brand new clothing, but you had no hangers, no closet, and no drawers in which to put them. Before long, your clothes would be a mess. You cannot be a lady or a gentleman if you don't have a general framework of history, if you don't know that the Romans were further from Plato than I am from Jamestown. Now think about that, Jamestown at the founding of our country. Most Americans think Greek and Romans. And I even read homeschool materials where they'll talk about the Greeks and the Romans. And they'll lump them into one category. What Greeks and what Romans? Plato wrote 400 years before Augustus was Caesar in Rome, the first real Roman emperor. 400 years! What's the year right now? Okay, take it to 1611. And then imagine somebody writing a book talking about English-speaking people all believe this. Well, who are we talking about? Bertrand Russell, the great atheist, or William Shakespeare, the great Christian playwright? The translators of the King James Bible named John Reynolds or John Reynolds of Biola? It's almost meaningless to say that kind of thing. The Greeks who are atheists or the Greeks who are theists? The Greeks who worship many gods or the Greeks who worship no gods? The Romans who believe that nature is all there is, was, or ever will be, or the Romans who thought that there was one God and it was the sun, or that there were two gods, a God of good and evil. Which Romans, which Greeks, and when? But notice, we oversimplify our intellectual life because we have no framework in which to put the facts. Almost all of you should work with a timeline, therefore, directly in front of you running at least back to about 500 and forward to now. World War I, you will discover, is more important to you than almost any single event because it's so close in time. Why did 9-11 happen? Because the Serbs shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Why did they do that? Because the Ottoman Turks caused the fall of the last Roman Empire in 1453. How did the Turks do that? Because a group of Western Christians decided in the 13th century that sacking a Christian city that had kept them safe from Islam was a great way to get some loot. History is a long thing and it's complicated, but if you don't have a framework and I just hand you a book, well, why do I need to know this? Well, you don't if you're going to be a sheeple. But the liberal arts education of high school, which now we make everybody do, and it's really kind of a pity. Most people just want to be sheeple. They want to do what they're told. If you don't want to do what you're told and you have no clue when World War I took place, you're going to be a sheeple because a good talker, and I know good talkers, will be able to manipulate you into anything. If you have a framework of history, you can begin to put the facts in it. So textbooks are good for getting a framework of history, the history of ideas, and getting facts to stick into it so you can go read actual books and dialogue and love the dead. That's the purpose of reading. Now, how do you learn to think well? This is where parents will have to monitor what you're doing because you're under age. What I would advise to do is begin to take the ideas you have and go to places like the WashingtonPost.com and dialogue with the bloggers there who are serious people, most of whom disagree with you entirely. Want to be a better writer? Go mix it up with people that don't agree with you. Especially as you get older, to the 17, 18 year olds in the room, begin to take the ideas you're learning in STAR and begin to mix it up on your home blog, in your home writing, 
and in the comment boxes at prominent places, and here's what will happen. You will lose almost every argument you're in. Because you'll be young, and you're using borrowed ideas. Losing doesn't mean you're wrong. Losing means what? You may be right, and you need to sharpen your thinking. But the best way to sharpen your thinking is to lose an argument, go back and forth, and say, wow, I did my facts right, or this didn't go well, someone exposed me this way. Sit with your parents and work through what went wrong and how you could have sharpened up the dialogue. In other words, what's the best way to learn critical thinking? Actually engage in critical thinking with people who don't like you. And the internet now allows you to do that relatively safely with your parents' supervision. Have your own blog, open up the comments, put your ideas out there in dialogue. Why would you write a paper in school and not let the general public read it? If it's not worth my reading, it's not worth your writing. So throw it out there and see what occurs. The second thing is, use social media to read together. The nice thing about being a homeschooler now, that wasn't true even a decade ago when we began homeschooling, is that you no longer have to read a book alone. And almost no book was designed to be read alone. Augustine was shocked the first time he saw someone reading a book silently because it was so stinking selfish. With very few copies of a book, how were most books read? out loud so anyone who wanted to access the book could at least hear it while you were using it. That means most books were meant to be heard, think Paul's epistles, not stared at, think Hamlet, which actually was designed to be performed. There is no text of Hamlet for sure, only different performances of Hamlet. How can you do this in a home school where you might be sitting in a room by yourself? Again, with your parents' supervision, nobody made you sit on Facebook chat and have meaningless conversations about who's dating whom. <laughs> One thing you could theoretically do, theoretically, is sit with a group of two or three people reading a book together, commenting together on Twitter or on Facebook, building up a pile of notes from a community of readers. Many of you don't like studying because studying, bizarrely in our culture, has meant studying how? Alone. But technology has made it possible for everyone to study the way studying was designed to do, which means in community. Now, just like studying alone can turn into a waste of time because you could sit there and zone out at your desk, so obviously studying using social media could turn into an excuse just to sit and gossip. But you'll have to not do that. Right? Just as when you're by yourself, you need to focus, so you need to use social media to study in community. Your parents can help you do this. Because notice, anything you write on Facebook remains in the history. Don't purge your history. Get done with the end of the day and say, okay, mom and dad, we have a commentary here on this book we're reading as a community, whether it's Johnny Tremaine or any other book you happen to be, yeah, textbook. We read this book together and here's what we pulled out of it. We think there's an error on page 15. Uh, we don't get what's being said here, or this was terrifically boring, could Star find a different book? But notice you'll have a community transcript of what the class did. What teacher wouldn't like to have that? Teachers will love this too. I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll be done. Reading well, writing well, thinking well consists of knowing why you're doing, doing it well, and learning to love. And practically, I think it means writing in public and dialoguing in public, not dialoguing alone. Because school wasn't designed to be alone. Questions, comments, insanities. <laughs> Rejoice in computers, don't fear them. Yes, you can access horrible things like pornography on the internet. But as a percentage, there was more pornography in Uncle Bob's drugstore than there is on the internet. Just because it's there doesn't mean you have to access it. You also have awesome tools that means you're never isolated. You're always able to learn in community. So learn in community, don't just sit there and gossip. Grow up, losers. 
<laughs> Come on, a couple of questions. Please, one, two. I know, I know, it's about 10 of. I'm sorry, I'm so weird and intimidating. I didn't wear a frock coat today, just so you could relax. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. This isn't a question, it's kind of a frustration. I love to read, but when I get to school, they give me so much homework that I can't. So how do I balance it? Um, the joy of homeschooling is, I'm going to give you a your mileage may vary answer. Um, Star is not responsible for what I say. And if what I say is wrong, then Star can beat this up later. But I homeschool not so that I can find some fascist tyranny to tell me what to do with my kids, because every kid is unique. So here's what I would suggest. Sit down with your parent and say, this work is helping me. This work is not helping me. This is turning into busy work for me. And with your parents, and then with the parent and the teacher, work out what you should be doing so you're not just doing pile of work. So that's thing number one. Now again, that's working with, some of what you think is busy work may turn out not to be. And yeah, sure, I, every Tory honor student thinks, wow, if you gave me five months to read The Republic instead of a week, I'd get a lot more out of it. Uh, welcome to the real world. When I worked in business, I, they didn't give me five months to prepare, prepare a business presentation. They gave me about 15 minutes. So one thing you have to learn to do in school is, of course, if we could all sit around and read at our own pace, the pace we had in seventh grade, we'd all love reading. You gotta, you gotta get to the major leagues, right, if you wanna be a leader. And so some of that is putting some heat on you and making you speed up. If you have a clothes closet, you'll be able to make connections that will freak people out and they'll think they're smarter than you are. So part of what Star's trying to do is info dump you because they assume you have that closed closet. Some of you don't have it, not because you were homeschooled, but because almost no Americans have it. Our culture is opposed to teaching you to lead because they want you to become sheeple. Nice little middle management job, keep your mouth shut, vote for who the leaders want you to vote for, or shut up. So you've got a tough spot, but I think the main thing to do is to try to negotiate with your parents to make Star and Tory Academy fit you, not that your mileage may vary general rules for what you're supposed to be doing in a Star class. And I'm pretty sure parents have that right, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I, and that's a great question because my job was to be an administrator and a teacher in a conventional school and most of my students go out to teach in government schools. I have yet to meet a teacher that you should leave your kid in class with. And there are two kinds of teachers, right? Teachers that you don't agree with but you're lucky you have your kid in their class because they're good teachers. And teachers you don't agree with that you should transfer your kid out of their class. Sit down with a teacher, and any teacher worth their salt, you can negotiate and say, this is my kid's learning style in my opinion, this is the kind of assignment that works with them. Be proactive, don't be aggressive, write, and then almost every government school teacher I know that I produce would rejoice in having a parent come in and say, you know, the fill in the blank thing isn't working for my kid. She does it and gets good marks, but it's just, could she write an essay for you? I have never met a teacher that would freak out. And if the teacher does freak out, thank you very much, go down to the principal and say, I'd like to transfer my student to Mrs. So-and-so's class, who isn't going to freak out in having a proactive relationship with a parent. Does that make sense? Don't let us tell you we're the experts. You know your kid better than we do. You're often wrong, but dialogue so that when we're right and you're wrong, you can hear us and vice versa. After all, homeschooling wouldn't work if we were the equivalent of medical doctors and lawyers. Educators don't have some secret noetic ability that you don't have because if you took your kid out of school, they wouldn't do a lot worse than they do in school. Whereas if you pulled your kids out of the medical system, they'd be in real trouble. Or if you're your own lawyer in court, you're in real trouble. 
So for us to pretend that we have like secret noetic wisdom that we're dumping on you is silly. Instead, we're dialogue partners with you. We're the delegated representatives as a university professor in helping you educate your son and daughter. I, I don't care if you dialogue with me about what would make Tory work at a college level for your kid. So if I don't care, why would they? One more. So we had someone here, yeah. You mentioned the uh, timeline, the history of the timeline, the students and the I, I cannot think. No, I, I really want to say this. I cannot think of anything more important than that, that I said today. Because when I do talk radio, and I'm dialoguing with people our age that call in, when they blow it, it's almost always because they have no idea of historical context. Do you have a plan, a program, an overview of how to start that process? Yes, here's the big problem. It's like learning a foreign language. All the joy is at the end, and all the onerous yuck is at the beginning. Almost no Americans speak a second language who aren't born in a home where it's done around them. Why? Why? Because it's all pain to start with and no pleasure. I, the bad news is you're just going to have to memorize. You just got to suck it up. All my kids, and here's the problem, they should have done it when they were under about 10, when kids are good at that. So for us as adults, some of the adults in the room need to realize, yeah, I don't really know the decade Plato wrote in. I'm not talking about the exact date, like the Norman Conquest, exactly what, when was it? I don't care if you know if it was 1066 or you'd guess it was around 1000. Notice if you can ballpark in the right decade, you'll probably be okay with what I'm talking about. But that's going to consist of, I, I'm sorry about this, this is the onerous, icky, students are going to hate me part of this. You just got to memorize a whole pile of dates. Remember when they told you, oh, it's about not getting the dates, but the big ideas. That's true. Except if you don't have the dates, you have no closet to hold the big ideas. So I made all my kids memorize all the presidents of the United States. So they'd have a framework to hang history. They'd at least have a sense that Jimmy Carter was a long time ago for them, but not a long time ago relative to the list of presidents. And believe it or not, that's a big stinking deal. The other thing I said that's controversial, and I'll end on this, is I genuinely do not think that students should learn alone for the most part. And that social media could be used by homeschool moms here to set up reading groups where people are reading in real-time dialogue with each other. Did everyone hear that? Can you do this? Yes, you can. The technology is free. It's available if you have an internet connection or a cell phone. So that all your students could do this. They already know how to use social media in an overwhelming percentage. Can you integrate social media into their reading time? Otherwise, you're asking your kid to do something that no reader outside of a small group of people who happen to be good at it has ever had to do in human history, and that is read alone. I happen to be good at reading alone. That's why I'm an academic. But unless your kid is going to be the tiny percentage of people who grow up to be academics, and we're going to need fewer and fewer of us, we are not a growth market. You want your kid to read in community because that's the way people read, because reading is to do what? What's the purpose of reading again? To dialogue with the dead, with people who are of a different culture, or different from you. So to do it alone is to defeat the purpose of dialoguing. Or, like a textbook or a wiki, it's to get just the facts, get in, get out, and get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.